I started hearing whispers of Thrawn's return as heir to the Empire. Welcome back, everyone. Is Charlie. This will be my full Star Wars Ahsoka episode one video and Easter eggs. There's a whole bunch of stuff, whole bunch of references to classic Star Wars, Star Wars Rebels, the Clone Wars, even to stuff during Knights of the Old Republic, confirming a lot of our theories. So we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. I've also got some extra Star Wars Echo Dots to give away too. All you have to do to enter that giveaway is just be a subscriber and post your favorite Easter egg from the episode on the video. Careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the episode yet. This will just be for episode one. I'll do a separate video for episode two that'll post tomorrow. Just starting at the beginning of the episode, working our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, and all the cool lore that Dave Filoni included. Generally, the series is meant to feel a little bit like Star Wars Rebels Season 5. Now, you don't need to watch every single episode of Rebels if you didn't watch those animated series. Like, there is a speedrun version of Ahsoka's storyline through Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, and Tales of the Jedi. So there are, like, some essential episodes that I would recommend watching. Really good example is there's some deep lore here for the Mortis gods. You'd only get that during the Clone Wars episodes and a little bit during Star Wars Rebels. Like you wouldn't get that if you only watch the movies or like the Mandalorian episodes. Also, all the Night Sisters stuff. Probably one of the coolest Easter eggs they bring back from the lore. I was waiting for them to do Night Sisters in live action at some point. Did not expect them to do it during Ahsoka. A lot of people wondering if we'll ever see Cal Kestis show up on the Mandalorian or the Ahsoka episodes or some point or maybe the Mandalorian movie. It's always possible. He is alive during this part of the timeline and Marin is also a night sister just like Morgan Elsbeth. Dave Filoni said he made a couple changes for this live action series from Star Wars Rebels. There's some overlapping timeline like some of the scenes during episode one are just like live action versions of scenes that we saw during Rebels. But he made a couple minor changes to the lore and practically like with the way they do the special effects and the makeup. For instance, Ahsoka's leku, like her head tails, are way longer and more accurate to what they were like during Rebels and Clone Wars than they were on the Mandalorian. Another big reminder too that Sabine Wren is also a Mandalorian just like Bo-Katan, just like Mando. She even has Mandalorian armor from Star Wars Rebels that we see during the episode. I'll explain that in a second too because there's some overlap here with what happened at the end of Mandalorian Season 3. The actual episode opens with the sound of drums like a classic samurai film because classic samurai films, classic Kurosawa samurai films inspired the original Star Wars trilogy so George Lucas was always a huge fan of samurai films. When Dave Filoni and Jon Favreau started doing The Mandalorian, they said that they wanted it to feel kind of like a space western, like the classic Star Wars movies, but when Dave Filoni started doing the Ahsoka series, he said he wanted it to feel kind of like a classic samurai film, kind of like Ahsoka's episode of The Mandalorian Season 2. Same basic vibe. So that's why this whole opening crawl here, also very classic Star Wars to have an opening crawl, feels like it came right out of a Star Wars samurai film. The other important detail a lot of you might have recognized here too is that the Star Wars logo in the opening crawl are in red lettering. That's a reference to the end of Star Wars The Clone Wars when the letters were in red. The reason why it changed to red is because it was mostly a reference to Anakin Skywalker falling to the dark side and turning to Darth Vader. There were a couple big Anakin Skywalker references and Darth Vader references during the episode too with some classic trilogy music cues. Now throughout the entire episode you probably noticed there were music cues for Star Wars Rebels, music cues from things from the original trilogy, all kind of mixed together into brand new music. There were a lot of visual references and verbal references to original trilogy and classic stuff too like Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, basically a mishmash of easter eggs from all over the canon. The sinister agents that it refers to are Morgan Elsbeth, the Shadow Council, Thrawn himself, Balin Skull, and Shin Hati, his apprentice. It explains the basic premise of the series that Ahsoka is trying to learn where Thrawn is and keep him from galvanizing the Remnant Empire so that they won't try to overthrow the New Republic, which obviously they eventually do wind up doing. They also quickly recap her backstory from The Mandalorian and the Book of Boba Fett with the way that she captured Morgan Elsbeth and learned of Thrawn's existence. Like, wait a minute, he's still alive? Oh, crap. Then we pick up with the brand new New Republic prison ship when they reference Home One ship. That's meant to be the flagship of the New Republic fleet that Ahsoka goes to later, not this particular ship. This is just meant to be a brand new New Republic design that serves as Morgan Elsbeth's temporary prison. They made a reference to this whole phenomenon during The Mandalorian Season 3. The whole idea is that they were in the process of decommissioning all the old Imperial ships and the old Rebellion ships. Like that's what you see all these bones of Star Destroyers all over the place. So later when Hera talks about their quote unquote brand new ship, that's what she's referencing, like their brand new designs. Basically this whole opening scene is just Balin Skull and Shin Hati breaking Morgan Elsbeth out of that New Republic prison ship. And a lot of these references go back to the original trilogy too, like a lot of their verbal references. 
the older clearance code, the Return of the Jedi Easter egg, the older Jedi code left over from the days of the New Republic before Revenge of the Sith, that's meant to be a reference to Balin Skull's origin, which they kind of tell you throughout the episode. Basically, he is a Jedi who survived Order 66 in the Clone Wars and just went to ground and became a mercenary in the Outer Rim. That's how he hooked up with Morgan Elsbeth, who has been quote unquote paying him very, very well while he continues to train his apprentice in his own pursuit of the Force. When they exit the ship, that's also a reference to both Darth Vader, Emperor Palpatine exiting their transports during Return of the Jedi, like very mysterious, very sinister sounding exit of a ship. Captain Hale and his subordinate here, Jackris, are both brand new characters. They don't exist in the lore before this. They just created them for the show. He calls them on their bluff. They're definitely no Jedi. In the whole scene of show me your identification, you don't need to see my identification. Obviously a reference to Obi-Wan Kenobi during A New Hope. Only their response is to basically slice them all in half. Now, when he says they're no Jedi, they're also not meant to be Sith. Like, they're not full Sith. That's why their lightsabers are meant to be orange, not full red. The orange color, also an Easter egg for classic original trilogy stuff. Some of you might remember this. I believe it was the older posters. Some of the posters would show Darth Vader's lightsaber as orange just because of a coloring imperfection. But the whole idea is that their lightsabers being orange just means that Balin's skull is pursuing his own path through the force the same way the Ahsoka is. Like they don't follow the traditional Jedi teachings, but they also don't lean completely Sith. Kind of the same thing that's going on with the Grogu character on the Mandalorian pursuing his own path through the force that's not traditional Jedi. Right now in the timeline, Luke Skywalker is technically the only person who is pursuing a traditional Jedi path because he's trying to create that traditional Jedi Academy or recreate an Academy. During his epic hallway run here, you could just feel Dave Filoni behind the scenes going, you know what? Darth Vader had a really awesome hallway fight. Luke Skywalker got an awesome hallway fight in the Mandalorian that I did. I'm going to do that on my Ahsoka series now too, only I'm going to make it for another dark side character. Notice when he rescues Morgan Elsbeth, also meant to be a bit of a twist Easter egg for Luke Skywalker rescuing Princess Leia on the Death Star. And you notice when she tells Balin Skull about Ahsoka, he isn't surprised by the knowledge because he knows who Ahsoka is, Anakin Skywalker, who he knew at the Academy before Order 66, before the events of Revenge of the Sith, used to talk about Ahsoka with him all the time. So the whole idea is that when Morgan Elsbeth is like, you need to watch out for Ahsoka, he's like, oh, her, I remember her. While this is going down, on the other side of the galaxy, Ahsoka is searching the ruins of the Night Sister Temple on the planet Arcana for the special star map, which is from Knights of the Old Republic. But I kind of think that Dave Filoni is saying here that the Night Sisters themselves created the map because of the temple here and the way that it exists. When Ahsoka is saying that the planet used to be a Night Sister stronghold thousands of years ago, she's talking around the same time as the Jedi Mandalorian Wars. So this is like the tail end of the Old Republic era. Within the canon, it was the ancient Rakata Empire that created the original star maps, and they far, far predate the Jedi and everything that happened during the Old Republic. Like, they're ancient beyond measure. So the idea is that the Night nice Sisters might have just been taking advantage of Rakatan technology that they found when they came along. But the cool thing here, though, is that confirming Morgan Elsbeth is a Night Sister, I don't remember that they did that on The Mandalorian. Maybe some people talked about it at The Mandalorian episodes came out, but this is huge. It explains so many things about her character. Mostly how she's able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ahsoka. Like, she'd be just as powerful as Ahsoka. Is that the whole idea is that Night Sisters just practice the Force in a very different way. They connect with the Force in a different way, which is why all their powers are so different. Anyone who played the Jedi Survivor or Jedi Fallen Order games knows all about Marin's powers. Basically, that's like the host of Night Sister abilities. They have all kinds of crazy powers. Most of this scene with Ahsoka, though, is her going full Indiana Jones in the Star Wars universe because Indiana Jones is George Lucas's other big franchise. But the idea is that the star map is going to help them locate where Thrawn and Ezra Bridger went, where the space whales took them, the Purgles. That's why we saw the Purgles at the beginning of The Mandalorian Season 3, like Grogu sees them in hyperspace. They had a big story arc during Star Wars Rebels, but the idea is that their race just lives in hyperspace. They can navigate hyperspace naturally. Notice when she's looking at all the carvings in the room, too, she starts to hear whispers of Force Spirits. Those are the whispers of the Night Sisters calling to her through the Force because this area is strong in the Force. Zoom in and hands on the floor there, the patterns on the floor, like the carvings, are also the same designs of the Mortis gods during those episodes of Clone Wars when Ahsoka, Anakin, and Obi-Wan met them. There are a couple references to the Mortis gods later too. They did Mortis gods also during Star Wars Rebels, so like they're really, really big in the Dave Filoni canon. She calls Hu Yang for help. He's played by David Tennant. You hear his voice a little bit at the beginning here. He's the same Jedi scholar droid that we saw during the Clone Wars who has plans for every single lightsaber ever created. 
He's meant to be about a thousand years old, older than Master Yoda, but not quite as old as some people think that he is. Like, he's not an old Republic era droid. She gets attacked by Thrawn's HK droids. Technically, they serve Morgan Elsbeth right now, but they have a cool lightsaber battle just to start things off, show you some of her skills, and how quick she is, and how good their special effects have gotten. That trick she uses, cutting holes in the floor with her two lightsabers she used all the time on Clone Wars and during Star Wars Rebels. R.I.P. to this ancient Night Sister temple. You can see Morgan Elspeth later in the episode when she comes back like, man, this sucks, they had to blow it up. Shed a little tear for the destruction of her culture here. She uses a force jump to make it back to her ship, and she and Hu Yang just have some witty banter together to give you an idea for their relationship. Very sassy the way that he was during the Clone Wars episodes, like his personality is the exact same. He references standard Jedi mission protocol and how he's still subject to his programming given to him by the ancient Jedi Order a thousand years ago. Despite the fall of the Order in present day, his programming still remains, so he keeps going back to that. He also references the roles of Jedi Padawans because he spent most of his time helping Jedi younglings construct their lightsabers. He's also typically accustomed to dealing with Padawans and younglings too. And he knew Ahsoka when she was a Jedi Padawan. A lot of people also sensing, too, that this whole map MacGuffin is similar to the MacGuffin during Force Awakens, like they needed to find the star map to get to Luke Skywalker. There are a couple familiar things, but most of the references during this are to the classic stuff like Star Wars Rebels, the Clone Wars, the prequels, and the original trilogy, and stuff that happened during the Mandalorian episodes. The other joke here, too, is about Ahsoka breaking Jedi protocol when she used her powers to get Morgan Elspeth to tell her where the star map was, like, oh, I convinced her using my Jedi mind trick. Both Anakin and Ahsoka were famous for never following Jedi protocol. It was one of the big memes of the Clone Wars, like Obi-Wan Kenobi kind of shepherding two little chickens who would never listen to what they were told to do. Notice when the New Republic flagship, Home One, calls her, they reference her as Fulcrum. That's her role during Star Wars Rebels, during the Rebellion. The whole idea is that during the Rebellion, she served as sort of the point of communication between the disparate Rebel cells. So like during the events of Star Wars and or before the original trilogy, she was still serving as Fulcrum. But mostly we saw that during Star Wars Rebels. Notice when they come back to the New Republic fleet, she clocks the ion cannon battle damage on the New Republic ships. That's meant to be from skirmishes that they've had with the Remnant Empire's forces like the Shadow Council and all their different factions. We get a reunion with Hera, who's played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead. General Syndulla is a reference to the Rebellion. She was a general. She even gets referenced during the events of Rogue One, too. Notice when she gets off her ship, too, there's a gonk droid walking behind her. There's always a gonk droid. Like, somehow there's always a gonk droid walking around in the background randomly in all these different Star Wars series and movies. Can't have a new episode without a gonk droid somewhere. The briefing room is meant to be the exact same kind that they used during Return of the Jedi. There's also a bunch of music cues from the original trilogy, that John Williams classic music. The reason why Ahsoka doesn't remember Balin's skull is because she left the Jedi Order, but Balin's skull knows exactly who she is. He remembers all the talks that he had with Anakin about her. She says, these days, there are few who can wield the Force. That's a reference to pretty much all the different Force users that we've seen on the show, like the brand new Dark Jedi Morgan Elsbeth, who is now confirmed Night Sister, meaning that she's also Force sensitive too. But also to characters like Grogu, who we haven't seen come on the series yet. We'll probably cross over at some point. You also have Luke Skywalker and Leia. We'll see if they cross over to the series too. Probably not Leia. Maybe a Luke Skywalker crossover, at least by the Thrawn movie. Can't have a giant Thrawn Star Wars movie without a Luke Skywalker cameo. They reference the star maps literally from Knights of the Old Republic, confirming all of our theories. She also references the last remaining Grand Admiral. Now notice in the canon there were only 12 Grand Admirals, but the Emperor secretly named Thrawn his 13th Grand Admiral. I believe it was number 13. Like Thrawn was like an extra secret Grand Admiral. Normally Grand Admirals would be about the rank of Grand Moff, but technically Grand Moff Tarkin was the most powerful person next to someone like Darth Vader who held kind of a special position inside the Empire. He wasn't traditional military like Grand Moff Tarkin was, but he was just as powerful. So if you had a giant meeting and they were all standing together, technically Grand Moff Tarkin would lead the meeting and Grand Admiral Thrawn would be like just under him. One of the reasons why Thrawn wasn't around during the original trilogy, though, is because during the events of Star Wars Rebels during the ending, he basically got jumped to the Outer Rim by the Space Whales, so he was gone for the entire original trilogy. Just to speedrun Thrawn's backstory, the canon version of his backstory, so during the Clone Wars, Anakin Skywalker, who's still on the light side, like he hasn't turned to Darth Vader yet, accidentally bumps up against Chiss Space and finds the Chiss and learns of Grand Admiral Thrawn's existence. Thrawn very shrewdly senses that if the Emperor learned where the Chiss were and learned in the Unknown Regions, 
the Empire would subjugate his people just like they did for everyone else in the galaxy. So in order to try and save his people, Thrawn basically threw himself on the spear, like sacrificed himself by turning himself into the Emperor and promising to serve him with his superior mind in exchange for leaving the Chiss alone. Now Thrawn still tried to be a good Grand Admiral, like he still served the Emperor well, but it was basically a long con, like he wanted to do everything he could to just save his people. Now the idea is in present day, Thrawn believes that he can do a better job of managing the galaxy than the New Republic is doing because they were shown to be pretty ineffectual during the events of the Mandalorian. So that's why Thrawn doesn't want the Emperor to come back. Like he doesn't like the Emperor. Pretty much nobody with a few exceptions don't want the Emperor to come back. Like Moff Gideon definitely didn't want the Emperor to come back. And the other thing they teased during the Mandalorian season three is that most everyone, like the Shadow Council, don't like Thrawn either that much, mostly because he outshines them. He's so much better than the rest of them. Most of the Thrawn Easter eggs in the episode are from Star Wars Rebels, though, and what he did during the events of Rebels. But a lot of the series in the Thrawn movie are borrowing from the original Thrawn trilogy of books, Heir to the Empire, Dark Force Rising, and Last Command. If you really want to go on the deep dive, I would definitely recommend checking out the original Thrawn trilogy because it is an amazing trilogy of books, even if not all of it is going to still be canon. Not everything, some of it though. The whole idea in present day though is that Hera apparently thought that he died at the Battle of Lothal, which is basically the ending of Star Wars Rebels. So when the Space Whales jumped the Seventh Fleet, his fleet away, they assumed that he died, but they also think that this might mean that Ezra is still alive too. The Mon Calamari that yells at them too might actually be Admiral Akbar because he was still very much alive during these events up to the events of Force Awakens. He got killed by the Star Killer base. Then they go back to Lothal. They're celebrating the anniversary of the Battle of Lothal, unveiling the mural from Star Wars Rebels. Like this is right out of the end of Rebels with the crew of the Ghost, the Loth Wolves, drawn in the same style of the animated series characters. But in the context of the series, it's meant to be Sabine Wren's art, like she painted the mural. Governor Azadi here is played by Clancy Brown, which is a big Easter egg for Star Wars Rebels because he also played that character during Star Wars Rebels. It's like another person who just came back as the live action version of their character, just like Grand Admiral Thrawn, who's being played by Lars Mikkelsen as he did during Star Wars Rebels. Governor Azadi used to be an Imperial Moff during Rebels like Moff Gideon, but he eventually started helping the Rebels. He was basically in charge of Lothal, this area, during the days of the Empire, which is how he connected with all the Rebels characters. The whole thing with Sabine Red ducking out on the dedication speech, acting very rebellious, is meant to be the way that Ezra Bridger used to act when they first met. Like the whole idea is that she was more classical Mandalorian when they first met, more about order, more about duty. But over time, they grew so close that her personality started to be more like his. Senator Jai Kel was also a character from Star Wars Rebels. He worked with the crew of the Ghost and Ezra. Eventually, he became the senator for Lothal in the New Republic. The first shot of Sabine riding on her bike really fast away from the city is also meant to be a reference to Ahsoka returning during the final Clone Wars episodes, kind of doing the same thing. Dave Filoni now canonizes the E-Wing, classic deep cut from the Dark Empire series, and this R2 unit is actually based on the prototype for the original R2-D2 toy. Back at her apartment, you notice she has a pet Loth cat, which is basically like the Lothal version of a cat. It even purrs, it acts kind of like a cat. All of her graffiti artwork from Star Wars Rebels is all over the place. Like this is her graffiti. Pretty much all the items lying around are from Star Wars Rebels, like this pile of Stormtrooper helmets. This is Ezra Bridger's Stormtrooper helmet from Rebels. Her Mandalorian armor is underneath here. Obviously she puts it back on in episode two, but this is right out of Star Wars Rebels. Remember, she is a Mandalorian, just like Bo-Katan. She's from House Wren. There were reports that she was supposed to have a cameo scene at the end of Mandalorian Season 3 when they retook the planet Mandalore because why wouldn't Clan Wren also be there? I think it was more of a budget thing because Temuera Morrison said that he as Boba Fett was supposed to have a cameo scene in the Mandalorian Season 3 finale, but they didn't actually wind up doing it, probably because of budget. She listens to Ezra Bridger's message to her again that he recorded before he disappeared with the space whales at the Purgles. All the other stuff in the container here were his belongings or are his belongings. Notice Ezra is wearing his suit from Rebels. He's played by Iman Isfandi. I don't know which episode will actually see him and like when they actually do wind up finding him. It might not be till later in the series. Notice on the wall behind her too, we see some Loth cats and Loth wolves. I wonder if we'll see some of the Loth wolves because they're actually pretty powerful. Based on his message talking about making this sacrifice, doing the Jedi thing, making the hard choice to get rid of Thrawn, it sounds like he recorded it before he left to take down Thrawn at the end of Rebels. The other references about becoming a Jedi are also meant to foreshadow Sabine Wren resuming her Jedi training with Ahsoka. 
Separately, Balin Shin Hati, the former Inquisitor Marak here, who we haven't really seen do much yet, and Morgan Elspeth track Ahsoka back to Lothal. When she says she's a Night Sister survivor, like I am a survivor, that's also meant to be a reference to Balin's skull because he survived Order 66. The reason why Morgan Elsbeth is still a Night Sister and survived Order 66 because the Empire tried to kill all of the Night Sisters is because she started serving Grand Admiral Thrawn. So essentially, Thrawn saved Morgan Elsbeth, which is why she's loyal to him. Sabine starts getting some forced visions of Ezra in her sleep, mostly dialogue from his message replaying that, wakes up as Ahsoka passes by, and this is meant to be the exact same scene from the end of Star Wars Rebels, but in live action. This is a bit of the overlap with that very end scene from Star Wars Rebels. The whole idea is that there's beef between her and Ahsoka because at some point during their training after the events of Rebels, but before the events of the original trilogy, Ahsoka just took off into the Outer Rim to just meditate and stew by herself because she is such a loner. Notice she wins her back with the mention of Ezra's name. The ship that they go back to is Ahsoka's ship. She sees her graffiti from her old bunk after the events of Star Wars Rebels when she was serving as her Padawan. There are a couple music cues from Star Wars Rebels too. And even though Chopper doesn't come back till episode 2, these are some scribbles of Chopper. When Sabine is wondering if Ahsoka gets tired of never having a permanent home, the whole idea is that Sabine stayed on Lothal because she promised Ezra that she would take care of Lothal in his absence. They reference more of their history as Jedi, Master, and Apprentice, the relationship, and confirm that Sabine was a Jedi Padawan and is also Force-sensitive. Answering the question once and for all, a lot of people wondering how they were going to play this. No, they're just saying that Sabine always was Force-sensitive. They hinted at it during Star Wars Rebels, but they never fully explored it. Like, they were just kind of ambiguous about it. I think it's because Dave Filoni wanted to save it for something later. There are a couple more Clone Wars Easter eggs here, too, for Hu Yang's character. He's able to analyze Balin and Shin Hati's lightsabers because he has the database of every single lightsaber ever constructed by the Jedi Order, so he can figure out who they are just by looking at the lightsaber hills. But the thing here is that he can't identify Shin Hati's lightsaber is because it was brand new. It was created after the fall of the Jedi Order. That's how they deduce that she is Balin Skull's apprentice. Like, oh, he's teaching her in the ways of the Jedi, even though they are not Jedi themselves. The scene of her clocking Sabine with the probe droid, also very similar to Darth Maul tracking Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan, Kenobi, Anakin during Phantom Menace. Notice when Sabine starts examining the star map, you also start to hear more whispers of the Night Sisters, whispers from Force spirits around her too. Then Ahsoka starts talking about Anakin Skywalker with Hera. Weren't you separate? Didn't you have the same kind of relationship with your master? In talking about musical cues like musical Easter eggs for the classic trilogy, for the prequels, for Clone Wars, when they mention Anakin Skywalker, it plays the darker Darth Vader music cue because of Ahsoka's trauma, like her regrets of what happened. When she says sometimes leaving for the right reasons have the wrong consequences, that's actually a reference to the way she always blamed herself for what happened with Anakin and falling to the dark side, turning into Darth Vader. She actually blames herself that he did that. She feels like if she'd stayed with Anakin and hadn't left the Jedi Order, which we saw during the Clone Wars, like she makes a big reference that I left the Order. She feels like had she been with Anakin, she would have been able to help him with his troubles, like with his Force visions, and none of the bad stuff would have happened during Revenge of the Sith. Order 66 wouldn't have gone down the same way and he wouldn't have fallen to the dark side. When Sabine unlocks the star map, the location that it shows isn't for where Thrawn is, it's where the space whales took them at the end of Rebels. Thrawn and Ezra just happened to be in the same place when they were taken there. We get another cool lightsaber fight between Shin Ha Ti and Sabine, also her fighting the HK droids. The green lightsaber that she grabs is Ezra Bridger's original lightsaber. He left it with Chopper and that's where she got it from. Here's the important thing though, she's clearly outmatched by Shin Hati, like they're both Jedi apprentices, but Sabine hasn't trained in a long time, so she's way outmatched at this point in the series. I think the idea is that by the end of the series, she'll have caught up to her, like she'll be about an even match for her, but that's why Shin Hati's fighting style seems much more traditional Jedi, like she's using traditional Jedi fighting forms, the same way that Anakin, Obi-Wan, Balan Skull would have learned when they were at the Jedi Academy. Luke Skywalker's fighting style with the lightsaber is a little more raw because he only got to train with Yoda and Obi-Wan for a little while before they died and then kind of had to figure it out on his own as he went along. So that's why Shin Hati's fighting style seems much more refined than Sabine's. She runs her through, obviously she's going to survive because we know she's in the rest of the series, but they end with a title card dedication to Ray Stevenson because he passed away, may he rest in peace. I don't know what they're going to do with the character in season two. But the actual end credits are basically the same star map designs that you saw in the ancient Night Sister temple, but in full color. And they show you a lot of the space whales, depictions of the space whales, Loth Wolves, a lot of designs that you saw in the world between worlds as well, too. 
There were so many Easter eggs and references during the episode. If there were any that you spotted that I didn't talk about during the video, just write them below in the comments. In my full episode 2 video, we'll post Wednesday morning. Make sure to enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss that. Click here for that full episode 2 video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that. And click here for all my other Star Wars, Ahsoka, and Mandalorian videos. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.